Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today we have in our studio uh, Kim Martindale. Um, Kim Martindale, I've known him for well, 15, 20 years or so. Uh, he's been uh, pro a producer of many art shows throughout the country, coast to coast, you could say. Uh, he's a passionate collector and, uh, and an art collector himself. Indeed. So, yeah. Welcome, Kim. Great to be here, Leroy. Thanks for inviting me. So tell us a little bit about who you are, where you came from, um, and then let's get into some of your ac accomplishments in life. Uh, you gave me a list, so we're going to see if you <laughs> remember all that stuff. So go ahead. Well, I've always been a collector. Um, from the earliest moments of my life, I think I picked up any stone that had a point on it, and it was my arrowhead, and I'd share it with people when I was like two, three. By the time I was six, I called my room the Kimrarium Museum, <laughs> and I had little shelves and all kinds of collections from shells to whatever I could find, really. And that really developed then into um, interest in American Indian art. And I did draw and paint in high school, well, all my life through college. And so um, that really took me more into the fine art world as well. And so I've really been a collector of indigenous material from all over the world and fine art. But really my two emphases, I would say, are, are American Indian or First Nation of Canada and the U.S and then down into Latin America, and then to Asia, because I spent some time living in Japan and China and learning about their art cultures and their culture and languages. And so it's really brought in my horizons to kind of be more international and reflect back on American Indian art. And it's really brought me to the place um, that I really feel that American Indian art holds up against any art form in the world and the historic material has a certain strength to it an inner strength and what's being done today in the contemporary world and actually was started back in the 60s with Fritz Scholder and the whole school here in Santa Fe and the movements that were started here and then have continued and I think there's just so many amazing contemporary artists today um, so it's exciting to be actually be part of this movement at this time. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so as I mentioned in the intro, uh, you've, pro you've been a producer of art shows um, across the country. The, the more famous one that I'm familiar with is the LA Art Show. Um, tell us about how you got into that exhibition business and uh, tell us about the journey you've had in pro producing these shows. Well, when I, when I moved to California from Massachusetts, um, I'd lived my childhood in Canada and then to the East Coast and then back to California. And when I came to California, I actually discovered that there were shows that were dedicated to American Indian art. And these shows were more about um, historic material or contemporary pottery, jewelry, um, Navajo textiles, baskets, that type of material. And there were several of them in Los Angeles, and we had moved to Santa Barbara, California. And my parents were kind enough, luckily, because of my strong passion and desire and push, they would take me down to these shows in Los Angeles. And so I was just 12 or 13 at the time, and uh, got to start to get to know dealers and collectors down in, at these shows. And one of them, named Don Bennett, um, took me kind of under his wing and said, you really like this stuff? And I said, yeah, I love this stuff. And he goes, well, then you're on the wrong side of the table. Get on this side <laughs> and start folding rugs. And, and he goes, well, this is how you fold a Navajo rug, which there is actually a special way to fold a Navajo rug. And so I folded rugs all day long because my parents would leave me at the show and then come back and pick me up. And and when they came back, they were like, God, this is great, Kim. Like, you know, you're starting to meet people. And, and so then I started actually having my parents drop me off at these shows and and or Don would pick me up on the way to a show in San Francisco and I'd do the show over the weekend and then come back and so I kind of got into setting up at these shows and selling things at these shows from like 13 on and, and finding art and um, I found this piece at the Rose Bowl swap meet which was a, a great story and then by the time I was 16 I had been going to these shows and looking for art and buying and selling um, for three years which is 
pretty amazing at 13 pretty to young. 16. Yes. Yeah. But at that point, there was actually, there was Swai India Market here in Santa Fe in the summertime. And a lot of people that dealt in historic material would get together and deal out a La Posada hotel. And it was kind of, and Don Bennett thought, well, instead of like us out of hotel rooms, let's actually get together and do a show. So there was the first antique American Indian show in Santa Fe, and really first historic or antique Indian show anywhere in the world was here in Santa Fe. And I was 16 years old, so that's about 44 years ago now. And that was the first show that I was involved in. That show was more setting up tables, drawing you know, signs like, here's the entrance or whatever, <laughs> taking tickets. But then within about two years, by the time I was like, 17 just turning 18 Don was like why don't you run this show and so I started running that show and then a few years later evolved it into an ethnographic show and then an old west show so there was three shows back to back and then a few years later it was up to San Francisco for a show that I still do in Marin County which I've moved into San Francisco now in conjunction with a tribal and textile art show there but that show I've done now for 38 years in San Francisco and moved it to Marin for many of those years. But that was out of the San Francisco one. A curator at the California Academy of Science was getting a large collection and said, how do we promote this? And I said, well, maybe a good way is to do a show up there and you could do a display of the collection you're getting from the museum. And so he did that. Um, we did that together and that was the birth of the second show for historic material. And, and then since then I've done shows throughout the country, the East Coast, other shows in California with contemporary material and historic material. And then I was fortunate enough about 27 years ago to um, be part of a pool that FADA, Fine Art Dealers Association, was looking at to become the director and producer of a show in Los Angeles for fine art. And at that point, it was really more about historic fine art, um, California plein air and regional material. And I was talked to them and I said, as long as we can make it really an international, if we can grow it to an international show, I'm in. Because I think LA needs that and deserves that. It's an important city for art. And I still believe that. So I produced that show and it was kind of my child for 25 years and uh, stopped being involved in it about two years ago and now involved in some things here in Santa Fe. So. Well, what I liked and appreciated about the LA Art Show, uh, once you moved to the convention center, I noticed it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and also more interactive with international artists. I mean, you, did, uh, you brought in huge Chinese exhibits and, and things. Those are really fun to, to see and participate in. Yeah, thanks, because really my feeling about art is that there are specialties, and I think that that's great to do specialty shows. In fact, I'm working on a specialty show, but I think one of the things that a lot of people miss in art is that they, they only look at certain types. And I think like there's a whole world of um, Asian ink painting, Chinese, Japanese, Korean ink painting that a lot of people in the Western world don't even know about really. And there's that type of art all around the world, like Aboriginal work in Australia, what's happening in, in Africa at present. Um, and I think that people sh should look broader than a lot of times that um, the art world focuses on. And that's what I really tried to do in LA because with the LA Art Show because I really wanted to bring the world of art to Los Angeles and expose people to different types so that they could then really choose. And out of that world, one of my favorites, obviously from what we've been talking about, is American Indian and First Nation work from Canada. And I think that that work has started to finally really kind of um, catch hold in a greater way with it becoming an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum as the first American art. And I think that's a really important designator that it really is the first art of America and it, and it should be looked at that way. And I think collectors that look at American art really owe it to themselves to really look at Native American art. Obviously there's lots of other traditions here from regional material that was how LA Art Show got started to Latino or Hispanic work. There's a whole culture of that material. And I think that that's, that's one of the exciting things about the art world is that there are these different genres and different schools and different areas that people can look at and, and really see what responds that you respond to and then go forward with that. 
Well, you were always generous with uh, Blue Rain Gallery over there. Um, I remember one year you let us do a contemporary native exhibit of painters, and uh, a lot of people were like, what is this? <laughs> but it was great for exposure because most of what we do is educate, educate, educate. And maybe 90% of it is education and maybe 10% is actual sales. But uh, that, that was important and uh, for exposure for these younger artists that we have. And I was so excited that you were willing to do it because I know it's a big effort for you to bring all that artwork there and, and expose people to it. But I was really pleased with that exhibit that year and and then on from there I mean one year we had Tony Abeda come out and paint a mural and mm -hmm. I just think that you know and it was something that you know even one year I did a, an exhibition of Germantown textiles you know 1870 to 1900 and to me they are the first modern art created in America with the color palettes that are used in it the design patterns the contrasting colors and a lot of people that walked through that booth were just like oh these must be you know you know, in the last 20, 30 years, they're so bright and the color contrasts and all of that. And when you said to them, no, that was actually made in 1880, more than 100 years ago, people <laughs> were shocked that Blew that type of work was even being done or created, that there was this this group of artists in the United States doing something like that. Yeah, I, I, I appreciated that exhibit. That was fun. Um, so what are you doing now? Let's talk about the, the new um, uh, IC22. Tell us what that is. Well, it's a really exciting project for me because I've been coming, as I said, to Santa Fe since I was 16. So, and I've always looked at Santa Fe and I always look at the art world as something that should be collaborative. And I did something somewhat similar in Los Angeles with the Getty and many other organizations. Ron Hartwig was my co-chair and it was called LA Arts Month. And this is IC22, which is Indigenous Celebration and it's New Mexico oriented and 2022, and we hope it will actually continue into 23, 24 and onward. But 22 is an amazing year for New Mexico. From the museum exhibitions to Swaya Centennial to even little things like La Fonda Hotel turning 100 years old to the SAR to IAIA are all anniversary years for them. And so it's just, and actually COVID has helped create some of this because there were going to be some openings of the, like the Balzer Pavilion and, and Bosque Redondo that was going to be done in an earlier year. And because of COVID, things have been delayed. And so 2022 is kind of three years put into one of amazing indigenous art projects from museums to Swaya turning the 100 to new projects with Swaya that we're going to hopefully set a platform for Swaya to go to expand the next 100 years and take Indigenous American and U.S. and uh, First Nation Canadian art um, to whole new levels and really do new programming. But the exciting thing is really getting all of these art organizations from more grassroots like Vital Spaces to all the museums in Santa Fe to all of these other large gatherings that happen from Spanish market, folk art market, Indian market, to the galleries that are here, to have everyone working together and showcasing indigenous art, which it is time in the world of art for people to look towards indigenous art of the US and Canada because it is so important and there are amazing artists. And I think that we're starting to see that, which is exciting in other places around Canada. Definitely Canada's embraced it more than the US, but even in the US, more museums are starting to do that and collect it and do shows on it. And Santa Fe really, from my opinion, of traveling the whole world, but coming to Santa Fe for almost every year for the last 44 years is the heart beat of that it's the hub it is it's the hub for sure well i'm i'm really happy about this um who are some of the major players that are working with you on this so we have from the museum foundation to all the museums because they're having a, a great group of shows well the foundation has a the vladam opening up right they have the vladam contemporary which will be in august they have um a pottery exhibition that they're doing with SAR's collection, which is probably one of the greatest historic art pottery collections in the world. And they're putting that on. 
um, Here Now and Always, which was an exhibition that they had before. They're redoing that and relaunching that pavilion, which is great because it really speaks to the historic past and into the future. And I think that's really where we should be discussing American Indian or indigenous art at this point, like into the future. Yeah. Uh, when I first started doing that show with Don Bennett at the Hilton Hotel Ballroom, there was really kind of a Grand Canyon between collectors of historic and contemporary work. And I think there still are people that choose kind of the area that they like the best and will collect it. But I think that chasm is just like a little ditch and a nice little bridge over mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And people really go between the two. Like I know myself, as you said, more, I'm a collector. More, more so today than in the past. So much more yeah. so today. And like even I look at my collection, you know, when I was younger, it was almost all historic material. And now I would say my collection's at least 50-50 and moving more towards contemporary material. What's amazing is uh, a couple of years ago, I was had the opportunity to go to the Dykers collection in New York City, and which is now in the Met, I think, right? Yeah. Um, but it was interesting to see Rothko's uh, next to uh, Tammy Garcia or Preston Singletary. You know, it just, it, it, people uh, don't think that it merges, but it merges beautifully. It does indeed. And I think that that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't even realize about how many American artists collected American Indian art or First Nation art and you know um, so it's I think it's been an inspiration and something that people have appreciated collecting for many years and I think it's just it's it's time is now mm -hmm. so how's it going so far so so far we had at our last meeting which our second meeting for IC 22 um, we had 40 organizations all art organizations from small organizations to the largest the state as getting involved the city is really involved um, of Santa Fe we're hoping to take it to Albuquerque and other cities around New Mexico as well to invite everybody because it really is New Mexico as a whole you know up to Taos Santa Fe's the hub but I think Albuquerque's definitely doing some exciting programming and and other cities in New Mexico as well and and just Make sure you mark on your calendar a trip to New Mexico in 2022. And bring a friend or two. <laughs> exactly. You know, because word of mouth is the best way to do this. And uh, I'd like to encourage all of our collectors to share the, share the word. You know, uh, that's what helps us keep strong and healthy as a business. Yeah, I think there's some amazing galleries here in Santa Fe that's showcasing that contemporary work. And, you know, there's places like Site Santa Fe, which um, is going to do two major exhibitions, one of Jeffrey Gibson, um, and that will launch in, I believe it's April, but will be up through August, and they'll be doing a special presentation of that in August. So there's just so many programs, and, and as I said, Swaya is going to be doing some amazing new programming in the summer in August and leading up to it and after that and, and maybe I'll get invited back to tell you guys I want to give you a little teaser so that you are <laughs> interested in what's coming up in the future nice nice <laughs> <laughs> well with that we'll we'll save the rest for another interview in the future but we'd like to thank you for coming in today Kim and and much success and you have our support 100% uh, anytime on uh, as far as I see 22 I so appreciate that. You're a major, important gallery here in Santa Fe and have been here for a long time. And, and you've been supporting of things I've been involved in. And, and I think together, that's how we all build exciting things. So the world out there, come and see what's happening in Santa Fe. Yeah, well, wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that our podcast can be found on all the platforms from YouTube to Spotify to iTunes. Uh, you can also find it on our website under podcasts on the menu bar. Uh, also, I want to remind people that you can have fine art in your everyday life by going to blurainprintshop.com. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Hey, I'm done.